Good morning, everybody. I think there will be people who will be joining us, given that the weather is so awful outside, they'll probably be battling their way through the rain. Um, my first job is today is the safety message, so if I do that very quickly, um, and hopefully um, sufficiently clearly. So in the event of a fire alarm activation, please wait, make your way to the nearest exit, which I think is here, and the exit marked at the back. And once you've exited the library building, please make your way to the assembly point, which I understand to be just on the other left-hand side of Ship Street Gates, which is sort of through across that way, and sort of continues straight across to the um, outside wall of the, the castle. And then uh, the Ship Street Gate, if, any, if you're in any doubt, maybe follow the others. So, <laughs> yeah, in, the, in the true sense of uh, health and safety. Uh, we're delighted to see you here this morning. If this was our first uh, in-person marketing forum meeting, and a number of months ago, actually, when we were talking to Heather, Katie, and Lucy about missing audiences, we decided it would be a good idea to run a number of events in the same day. Uh, we've doubted the wisdom of that decision ever since, <laughs> but we are delighted to see you here this morning. And it is lovely to see people back in person, whether it be in a theatre, in a foyer, or in a, in a meeting like this. Um, the discussions from the Missing Audiences Survey, which many of you were probably party to over the summer months, identified, I think, something which maybe took us by surprise, and I, I think certainly took uh, Lucy, Heather, and Katie by surprise. And that is the percentage of people on your database that you actually can talk to. So in looking at audiences and inviting and welcoming mm -hmm. audiences back into our theatres, um, we identified, and indeed Heather and Katie particularly, and Lucy identified, that there were a very large group of people, possibly up to 80% of your contacts on your database that you couldn't talk to, or under the constraints with which you gathered the data, you couldn't actually invite them back or talk to them directly. Mm -hmm. So this morning's session, the first session this morning, is based on, I suppose, the marketing premise of getting those customers or audience members that you've had in the past, getting them back and getting them to come more often. It's probably the first and most important marketing effort that every organization needs to do post-COVID. Um, so this morning is a packed day. We will break after this session at 12.30 uh, for lunch, and lunch will be in the atrium area where you, where you had coffee earlier this morning. There will be more people joining us over the lunchtime period and other things going on, and then we'll be back here for the marketing forum meeting, I think at quarter to two. Um, but we'll remind you of those, and we'll sort of give you the, the time prompts as we go through the day. So again, delighted to see you here this morning, and huge thanks to Katie and Heather for taking us, and indeed everybody else, through the getting and winning audiences back, and indeed to Lucy, uh, Connor, um, and everybody on the Ticket Solve team because they've been supportive throughout and it's hugely appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Katie Rains. If you haven't met me before, I'm CEO of Indigo. Um, and I think my task today is to challenge some of our thinking around how we capture data on audiences to see if we can't do a bit better th than we have been. Uh, do you remember this? Those of you who came to Heather and my session on uh, keeping audiences and trying to get audiences back, we looked at um, suggesting that you look at your database and figure out how many people you've got on the database, how many have booked a ticket, how many have paid for a ticket, and then how many can you talk to? And, and in some cases, um, when I've looked at this on, on various sources of data, that's typically less than four in 10 people. So you're doing all that work to get them to come to something post-COVID. They're coming back. You're probably capturing their data because they're paying by credit card. And then you can't talk to six out of 10 of them. And the reason for that, in many cases, is, is because we're, we're asking them if they want to hear from us by email, aren't we? We'll, we'll talk about all the different ways in which you can, you can talk to people. But, um, Typically, people take the path of least resistance, don't they, when they're booking a ticket. They just want to book a ticket, get to the end, and have their tickets and come. So if they have to actually put a tick in a box to say, I would like to hear from you, that's getting in their way. So six out of ten of them don't do it. So what I'm going to explore with you today, I hope, um, are the laws around privacy and what you are allowed and not allowed to do. Okay. So that's what we're going to look at today to see if, there's, if we've missed any tricks that might help us with this. 
We're not talking about trying to mislead or con customers in any sense. In fact, the opposite. We want to be transparent with them. But I know there's a lot of confusion around. People can often go, oh, GDPR, oh, I don't know what that is. And for my sins, I spent, um, I mean, I'm an audience specialist, and I, I spent most of 2017 and 18 um, with clients ringing me up and saying, panicking about GDPR and going, does this mean we just can't talk to people anymore? What do I do with all the data I've got? How do we do it? And I'm not a lawyer, and I'm not um, a ticketing system um, provider, but I was aware that this was such a big thing that was happening that it was going to jeopardise a lot of the work that we were doing together with cultural organisations, looking at their data, how people were behaving, could we even ask people for a name and address when they were booking a ticket, all of that stuff. So 2018, now I look back, and I, I, 2018 um, GDPR seemed like a real crisis for the sector. I'm like, my God, that's small fry now. We've dealt with COVID, and now we've got energy crisis, and God knows what. Um, but yeah, so I worked through that with a number of organisations and, and, and sort of really trying to challenge some of the lawyer speak that we were getting from people as well. I think I went to so many GDPR talks and courses and came out going, I don't, still don't understand what they're on about. So what I've tried to do um, since that time is try and make it as simple as possible from what I know. Obviously, this isn't legal advice, <laughs> just should, should say that up front. I'm not a lawyer, um, but I'm just going to share with you what, um, what I've learned and, and where to send you to look for evidence uh, and direction on this stuff. So our aim really is how do we increase that, that number? How do we gather more permissions legally and ethically for customers? Um, I think it's fair to say that for email marketing, most of you um, from our research are asking, currently asking people to opt in to receive emails from you with that. People are nodding, yeah, okay. So as I said, ticket buyers are busy trying to get to the end, so they typically skip over any consent boxes. How could we make agreeing to hear from you easier, and as I've said, the path of least resistance for ticket buyers? How could we do that? So, I'm just going to take you through, and I'm sorry, you, you, you are definitely the hardcore people being here early and for a GDPR session, hats off to you. Um, so I'm just going to make sure we're all on the same page with, with the GDPR principles, and that it's really not that complicated. I mean, God, if you Google GDPR, you would think it was, and um, it's in lawyers' interest to make it complicated. But actually, it's fairly simple. What GDPR did was it put the, the responsibility onto the organisation to demonstrate that it complies with the law. How it used to work is you sort of did what you liked and you got fined if you got caught out, right? Now, it's, it's like tax, you know, it's no good tax avoided saying, oh, I didn't know. That's not good enough. You have to have things in place. Um, that's no excuse. So you have to take the responsibility to comply with the law. You're welcome to have these slides afterwards, so please don't feel you need to scribble frantically if you don't want to. Um, it's given customers, rightly in my opinion, more rights, because, I mean, we see what happens in the States with data, and it's just the Wild West, so we, don't, <laughs> we definitely don't want to go there. It's about customers having greater rights. Um, and the, the kind of carrot and stick approach, the stick, is that the fines are huge now. I think if you got caught by the, the commissioners and stuff before, it was... You know, even for a big company like an airline or something, it was like 150,000 or something like that was the penalty. Now it's 5% of global turnover. So if you're Ryanair and you get this wrong, you're out of business, really. Um, it's important to stress that GDPR is something that does cover the whole organisation. So all the personal data you hold as an organisation is covered by this. So employee data, supplier data, artists, as well as customers and donors. Okay, and it affects HR and finance as much as it affects marketing and fundraising. And it includes hard copy data. It's not just stuff that's on computers. It's, you know, forms with people's details on. But actually what we're going to focus on today, because our focus is about how do we maximise the data that we can use to talk to customers, we're just going to talk about customers when they're buying a ticket. Okay, that doesn't mean that all the rest of it isn't important, but we'd be here all week if we had to cover all that off as well. Okay. Um, it's just worth bearing, bearing that in mind. The same principles apply to all of that, um, just in slightly different ways. So we're just going to focus on customers buying a ticket. 
So here is my, lawyers would hate this because it's simple and it's easy to remember. <laughs> it doesn't owe them any money. So my three-step guide for GDPR for customer data. Okay, and sorry, GDPR is the regulation, if those of you don't know, the regulation from the European Commission around how data is used. It has various other names and terms and it's, it's being looked at. And there's also e-privacy regulation, which we'll talk about as we go through this as well. So, number one, be clear. Be clear with people what you're going to do with their data. Yeah, we all want that, don't we? If anybody's collecting our data for anything, why are they collecting it? What are they going to use it for? How can I make sure that that isn't passed on to somebody else and used inappropriately? We all want that. We want that for ourselves, our children, our parents, whatever. So be clear with people what you're going to do with their data. Number two, do what you've said you'll do and don't do anything else with it. Okay? So if I've said, if I go to the doctor and I say that I'm giving you my data so that you can provide me with medical services, I don't expect them to sell that data to a tobacco company or to some American healthcare company. Oh, that's what they're doing in Britain. Anyway, um, <laughs> but that's, so do what you say. So if you say, we're going to collect your data, we're going to use it for this, you can't then use it for something else. You would have to go back to the people again. So you know that data we've got about you, and we collected it for this, could we now use it for that? Okay, so it's all about what you've said you'll do with it. And then the final thing is stop doing it, stop using their data, either when they don't engage, engage with you anymore, or when they ask you to stop. And that's it, right, done. No. Um, and that those are the principles, really. If you can keep those three things in mind, so be clear what you're doing with the data and communicate that. Do what you said you'll do and nothing else and then stop doing it when there's no reason for you to do it or when they ask you to stop, okay? Everyone okay with that so far? Yeah. Good. So, sorry, this is the legal bit. It's not gonna get all legally after this, but this is something we do need to understand. You can only process personal data with a legal basis to do so, right? So that means if you've got any personal data, what do we mean by personal data? Anybody want to say what we mean by personal data? Email address. Email address. Name. Name. Anything number, that. Number. Address. I, yeah. <laughs> photograph. Anything that I put identifies that person as an individual. Okay. Is personal data. So in order to collect or process, and process also means store. So just by sticking it in a cupboard somewhere and not doing anything with it, you're still processing that data because mm. you're storing it and it covers paper as well as computers, okay. You need a legal basis to do that, and there are only six of them, which I have listed here, okay. For our purposes, we're only really interested in three of them for our ticket buyers. One, consent of the data subject. So that means you asking somebody and them agreeing to it, okay. Everyone clear about consent. Second one, performance of a contract. I am giving you this data in order for you to provide me with certain services. Yeah? So the company can use my data in order to provide me with those services. Right? So I give my data to the bank and by doing that I'm asking them to provide me with services X, Y and Z and they're using my data to provide those services to me. Yeah? They don't need to ask me every time they're processing my data because I've entered into a contract with them to say I want you to provide me with these services you need my data in order to do that so we'll come back to that in a minute so that's called performance of a contract and then the last one I think we need to look at is this mysterious one called legitimate interests mm -hmm. this is used as an excuse as in a catch-all for when you actually haven't sorted yourself out on uh, GDPR yeah? We're not going to use it like that. It's actually um, a very powerful legal basis and there are big responsibilities that come with it. So we need to be aware of those, but we're going to look at it as well. So this is where um, the, the controller here, so this is the organisation, says we have a legitimate business interest, a reason for our own uh, purposes to use this data in this way. Okay, And you're like, well, that's a bit... You know, not great, is it? Because any company could say that. But 
Legitimate interest can only be used when it's in balance with the rights of the individual. And you have to prove and show, if you're going to use legitimate interest as a business for using that data, that you have balanced it with the needs and rights of the individual. Okay? It's easy to do, and I'm going to argue why this is something we should look at. Um, but it's not just a catch-all for when we actually haven't sorted it out properly. Okay. Katie, I think you said a really important word there. Interest is just like this woolly woolly thing, but you said reason, yes. so it's a legitimate reason. And suddenly, I've had a light bulb moment. Great, because yeah. that's such a lawyery word, isn't it? You know, whose interest is it? It's like I'm interested in that. That's not how lawyers mean it. You're right. It's we have a reason to use this data for this purpose, but the law says you have to balance that with whether that's a reasonable thing to do, respecting the customer's privacy. Okay. So do you see the difference between those three things? I'll take you through them one by one. So consent. Okay. This is another lawyery word. Granular. <laughs> granular. I didn't really know the word granular until 2018, and then everyone was talking about granularity. I was like, <laughs> so consent. If you're going to use consent, it must be granular for each specific processing operation. Right. So if I want to use your data to send you uh, brochures, and I want to ask for your consent to do that, then I ask you, can I send you brochures by post? If I then want to um, do something else, send you information about fundraising activities, yeah, I have to ask you that question separately from sending you stuff about shows. Okay? So for each thing you want to do, you have to ask for consent for. The indication of consent must be unambiguous and involve clear affirmative action. Okay, so it involves going, are you, is it clear what I am ticking this box? What is going to happen if I tick this box? Yeah, am I clear what, I, what, is, what you're going to do with my data? So we'd like to send you stuff whenever we like, however we like, about whatever we want. It's not going to work. Okay, it's got to be clear and the person has to put a tick in the box. We'll come back to that in a minute. This is consent. And you have to keep clear records to demonstrate consent. Now this is where it all starts to get a bit scary for me because you've got to be able to demonstrate where you got that consent from. You've got to keep records. So if somebody says like verbally to me, add me to your mailing list, so I add them to the mailing list, I then don't have, I can't demonstrate that I had consent. Yeah, it's tricky. And taking consent by telephone, I was just having this conversation yeah. with a client last week, actually, this week, um, that you take consent over the telephone, and how do you actually prove yeah. that? And so what we decided was reasonable to do, and again, we've documented this in the processes, is for that to be time stamped on the box office system that that consent was taken at that point. Mm -hmm. And that there's a code added to it that basically says it's telephone verbal. consent, yeah. verbal consent is given. But if that person came back and challenged and said, how can you prove that? It's very difficult. And the bar is really quite high on this stuff. So consent is, isn't the easy option. A lot of people have kind of gone, oh, well, we have to do consent because that's the only way we're going to guarantee compliance. It's actually quite hard to demonstrate compliance of consent. And then, to make matters worse, people must be able to withdraw that consent as well. So they must be able to easily withdraw consent, yeah? So y you need to make it possible for them to ring you up and withdraw that consent if they want to. Here's some examples, sorry, boxes have gone a bit awry. Um, so here's some examples of consent. If you'd like to join our email list to hear about our shows, please tick this box. <laughs> if, you, if you'd like to hear from us by post to hear about our shows, please tick this box. Not the best word of playing Katie, but never mind, you get the idea. If you'd like to hear by email about opportunities to support our works, that's fundraising, I have to have another box, and then fundraising by post, another box. So you can see how you can quickly get in quite a mess with this stuff, and then somebody, some bright spark comes along in a few weeks' time going, oh, can we just change that? Can we just change that to say shows and events, or shows and activities? Well, what are you going to do with all the people who've signed up to when you said it was shows? So you want to to go back to those people and go, you know, we, we got your permission to do that with your data, well now we want to do something else with it, because they haven't signed up to activities, they've signed up to shows. 
And that is how consent works. It's really specific, it's really granular, it's a pain in the ass. Okay? Are you getting it? I don't like consent. <laughs> when no other option is open to you, and in fact the, the ICO, which is the Information Commissioner in the UK, actually said, only use consent when you can't use one of the others. They actually said that. Yeah. And there are some, some times when you need to use consent. You need to use consent if you're capturing uh, data on uh, sensitive data on people, like their health needs, or under 16s, children, or cert you know, certain um, sexuality or religion, things like that. That's sensitive data, and you absolutely need consent for that. But what we're talking about is email addresses for ticket buyers, not for sensitive data. Okay. Katie, and I think it's worth saying at this point that you have been through the UK advice and guidance and the rest of it about GDPR and compared it line by line with the with Irish, Irish version yeah, the same. and there is no difference because it's the all based on the same yeah. laws. At the moment. The Brits will go the way of America soon in many ways. I'm so um, sorry. So. <laughs> I'm so sorry <laughs> Thank you. the American in here. <laughs> it is annoying. To yeah. um, okay, so that's consent. So you can see some of the problems we've got with that but we're clear about how it works. Performance of a contract. Now, this is an interesting one because I hear a lot of people say, uh, oh, well, hang on a minute. How can I email people who've booked a ticket if they haven't given consent to talk to them and the show's cancelled? How come I can talk to them? Can I talk to them about that? They haven't ticked the box for marketing. What goes on there? So this is where this comes in. So when a ticket buyer buys a ticket from you, they enter into a contract <coughs> with you. Hopefully you've got some terms and conditions somewhere on your website that covers that. This gives you the right to process their data in order to fulfill that contract. Okay? They don't need to have ticked the box that says they want to hear from you about marketing in order to send them their tickets, because that would be stupid. They wouldn't get their tickets. Yeah? Yeah. So you can use their data to fulfill the service. So that includes contacting them by any means given. So if they've given you their telephone number, their email address, their postal address, you can use any of those to contact them in relation to their booking. Their payment, change of performer, cancelled performance, snow, whatever it is, okay? But you can't use it to do any upselling, fundraising, marketing of other things, so if you're sending out pre-show emails, they need to be really about, you know, here's what's going to happen, arrive at this time. You can say, here's where to park. You could say, there is a cafe, if you want to use it. You can give them information. What you can't go is it's a two-for-one deal on burgers. You can't do that. Or, by the way, there's another show similar to this one next week. Why don't you book for that while you're here? Okay? So it's, it's got to be very uh, related to the contract they have with you. And also, legally, this could include a post-show survey asking their opinion about the show. Because, the argument goes, you are checking whether you have delivered that service to them in an adequate way. And that is a, a, a completely legal thing to do afterwards. Now, you've got to be careful with that, because it's got to be pretty much about, you know, what did you think of the show? Did we deliver the service you're asking? You can't start going asking them all sorts of other questions about their inside leg measure. So you can't then add, join our mailing list at the end of the survey? No. You can do a kind of clever thing with the survey software that just lands on your website sign up page at the end. You can do that. Yeah, where it says exit. Exit. Where, where, yeah. where is it going to exit to? Exit to, instead of exit to our join our mailing list. Okay. I know you can't put that in the survey, no. but you could. They could just magically land on your page. That is, why not join our mailing list? Only no, nobody ever wants to join the mailing list. No. Exactly. Why not hear about our shows? Yeah, be the first to find else. out what's on yeah. next. All yeah. that stuff. Okay, so that's performance of a contract. Now, interestingly, um, what comes up a lot here is membership schemes where people have joined a membership scheme in order to get priority information about something. Okay, so if you have a membership scheme where one of the key benefits is be the first to find out, then by joining that membership scheme, as long as it's made clear by joining the membership scheme, we're going to 
let you know. You know, we're going to email you stuff. Uh, you don't need, they don't need to take a big box. They don't need consent because it's performance of the contract. That's the purpose of joining the scheme. They've asked you to provide them with those membership services, which includes sending them emails about stuff. Okay? Examples. So, email confirming a ticket transaction, performance of a contract. Pre-show email, as we've discussed, as long as it's just information. An email or a phone call telling people that a show's been cancelled. So you don't have to worry, if they've given you their phone number, you don't have to worry about um, them having opted in or checked a box or anything. If you've got their phone number and there's a council performance, you can ring them up. And you can do a tell us what you thought email survey. And as I've said, priority information for members, if that's a core part of the membership benefits that are listed. Okay, so now we get onto this murky world of legitimate interest. Okay, it's very clear in the legislation that the, it says you can use legitimate interest for direct marketing. What's direct marketing, Heather? Anything where you're communicating with an individual directly. directly. Yeah. As opposed to Facebook posts or advertising, things like that. Okay, but it needs to take into account whether it's something a customer would reasonably expect you to do with their data, the relationship between the customer and the organisation. So is that data, has that data been collected directly by you or has it been passed to you by somebody else? Um, I've put the legal bit at the bottom, Recital 47 it is, if anybody's interested. The processing of personal data for direct marketing purposes may be regarded as carried out for a legitimate interest. So legitimate interest again meaning good reason of the business to do this. I think it's just worth saying that, that you know, the third party thing would probably involve a production company in a venue. So yeah. whichever way it goes, that's a third party. That's a third party. So if the data hasn't been, if the customer has given the data to somebody else and the somebody else has given the data to you, yeah? So that needs to be taken into account. But if you are collecting data directly from a customer, um, you need to think about whether somebody booking a ticket with you, a customer would then reasonably expect that you would then tell them about other events similar to the one that they've been to. Okay? That's what the law says. So, can we use legitimate interest for postal direct marketing? I think a lot of you already are. Um, so, for example, you might say, you know, this venue processes data for certain legitimate business purposes to send you information about similar events and ticket offers by post. If you wish for your data not to be used in this way, you can ask us not to. So, and then as long as there's a link to the privacy policy, you, they don't need to opt out. So if you just want to send them things by post, you don't need to use consent, you could use legitimate interest, and you don't even have to give them the option to say, no, I don't want this. You just include in your privacy policy we're going to send you stuff by post if you've booked a ticket with us. If you don't like it, write to us here. Okay. Um, and the sort of data we're looking at there is the name, address, and booking history. Um, and it allows you to send direct marketing by post about events. Okay. Because that's what you've said. However, I suppose my question to you is is that clear? Is that clear enough? If you think about my three step guide, be clear about what you're going to do with the data, do what you say you're going to do, and then stop doing it. So the question for me about this is this feels a little bit smoke and mirrors for me. Yeah. It's legal. Lots of people do it. I bought some plant bulbs for my mother, and I'm now getting big, thick, bloody bulb catalogues through my door by post. I never asked for them. I know I have no intention of buying any bulbs for my garden. I'm a shit gardener. So, but that's how they did it. So it's legal. It happens a lot it's customer practice my question is is it is it really does it fit with your values that's for you to decide but you can't do that for email and the reason you can't do that for email is because there's this pesky little bit of legislation around e-privacy which sits separately from the GDPR helpfully why they couldn't just flip and sort it all out at once I've got no idea sits separately and it's really it was designed really to recognise that with the speed of technology development, 
there's a whole host of other things, ways in which people's personal um, rights, privacy rights, might be abused in a in a um, in the e world, in the electronic world, that um, need to be addressed separately. So, on the one hand, this is what is said: user consent should be obtained. There should be no, oh, before processing electronic communications, there should be no exceptions to process this data based on the legitimate interest of the data controller or on the general purpose of the performance of a contract. Okay, so Katie's talking all of this. Look, it says you have to use consent and you can't, ex you can't use exceptions to send people things by email, even for the performance of a contract. Well, that's stupid for a start, isn't it? Because we're going to email people their tickets. Okay, so that's what the European Data Protection Board said in 2018. And Article 16 of the Commission's e-privacy draft, it's still draft at this stage, states that end users may not be sent direct marketing communications unless they've given their consent. Right, so we're back on consent. Or are we? However, it then goes on in the same document to provide exemptions which include marketing to, marketing to existing customers as long as they provided the as long as we provided the opportunity for them to opt out of further marketing communications. Okay, so we're talking about email communications now. So if you're talking to existing customers, so not just randomly anybody, existing customers, and you've said to them, here's your opportunity to opt out, you can use legitimate interest. Can I just ask a really stupid question? What's an existing customer? I mean, how do you define an existing okay. customer? Well, it's, thankfully they haven't defined existing customers, but some of the, they have looked at it later on. So they mean somebody who's bought a ticket from you or is in the process of buying a ticket from you. Okay, we'll come on to how they define that a bit more neatly. So people who have bought a ticket from you. Okay, so you can't use this method for... Uh, just grabbing people's data and sending them stuff. They have, to have, they have to be in the process of buying something from you or have bought a ticket from you. So I'll explain how that works in a minute. You have to set a time limit after which you don't send marketing communications. So if, so if you gather this data in this way and then they don't buy from you again in a, in a certain period of time, then you have to stop. Well, that's just sensible, isn't it? If somebody isn't opening emails for like a year, then you probably shouldn't be emailing them anymore or work out why they're not opening them. And end users have the absolute right to object and you must stop marketing to them as soon as possible, but definitely within a month. Okay, so this is about, I mean, we've got the tools to do this. This is about the unsubscribe stuff. So if you send them an email and they don't want to receive emails from you and they unsubscribe, you have to stop sending them emails within a month. Well, that seems totally reasonable to me. Um, you also have to inform them that they've got the right to object and that you intend to use their data for marketing purposes. And by object, we mean unsubscribe. Unsubscribe, yeah. So here are your options for email marketing. You can use consent, which I think is what most of you are doing now. Well, that requires customers to actively tick a box so they're happy to receive communications by email. Typically, only four out of ten people are doing that, and it's fraught with difficulties in terms of uh, keeping track of those. You've got this legitimate interest. The email legitimate interest thing is called, really confusingly, the soft opt-in. But, um, but that allows you to send emails to customers who've bought something and given their email as part of the transaction, you can only talk to them about similar goods and services. So in other words, you could email people who have bought for shows about shows. Okay? Um, you need to define that very clearly for your own organisation and be clear what you mean by that. So do you mean performances and events? Do you mean performances, events and activities? Because it might be participatory stuff. Um, just you need to think about the right wording for that, okay? Can I give an example of my help? So in the UK, one of the big venues that does an enormous amount of classical music, you know, big concert hall thing, got 
find for sending the classical music audience information about boxing matches? <laughs> Those um, crowds are very similar <laughs> in their defense. Yes, I, I, I booked for, if any of you watched the bloody In the Night Garden thing with small children, it's like a kids TV show. <laughs> Everybody's making I, I went to, um, there's a character in it called Iggle Piggle and I went to kind of Iggle Piggle Live when my children were really small. And the company that put that on then sent me about six years later, so they must have assumed my kids were now 11, 12, something like that, um, an email about, why not bring your kids free to the Great British Shooting Show? <laughs> I was like, what? There's so many things wrong with that. Anyway, um, so you can only talk to them about similar goods and services. Some organisations have taken this to the absolute extreme and gone, well, if they came to a Brahms concert, we will only send them stuff about late, about you know, early romantic music. It's like, really? Um, I think we can be, for me, it's about being uh, clear, but broad enough with that definition of what you do that needs to encompass enough of what you do. And not being really stupid. Not being really stupid. <laughs> so similar goods and services, as long as they've been the given the option to opt out at the point of sale. So here is somebody buying a ticket, they've given you their email address. This legislation says you, if they're buying something from you, you can then talk to them about similar things, but they have to be told that at the point of sale, at the point at which they're giving you that data and given the opportunity to go, no, thank you. That's very different from you going, would you like to hear from us? It's going, we're gonna send you stuff about this, but you don't have to have it and be really clear and nice. If you would prefer us not to do that, tell us and we won't do it. And at every subsequent email that you send them. But you, I'm guessing you all have got that unsubscribe thing on the bottom of your emails, right? So that's not hard. So I just, I am a toddler, so my brain is broken. But, right. So just to be clear, they buy the ticket. We can say, we will be contacting you about similar goods and services. You can tick this to opt out. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. And every email you send them after that. As long as they can opt out. They need an opt out. Yeah. Okay. So that's pre ticked. Awesome. Yeah. Well, we'll come on to whether it's pre ticked or unticked and all of that in a minute, because <laughs> that's a whole other debate. Okay. And any data you've collected this way, not that I think you would, but you can't be giving it to other people. Sorry, another question. Um, so for instance, I'm with a small theater company and we just performed our show at two venues. Could we not get the emails from them, who, of people who purchase tickets to our shows, but at their venues? Do not we if, not if have they've collected the data under legitimate interest yeah. and the contract is with them, with between them, the customer and them, then they can't it. pass that data okay. to you. Okay. But to be honest, if they were using consent, because yeah. consent has to be granular, yeah. they would have to go, would you like to hear from venue A, yeah. tick, would you like to hear from company B? Okay, so then that could be something that then we negotiate with venues of having an opt-in for us. Yeah, or, and that's what a lot of organizations Or if there was a post show survey having it land on our own yeah and that's list. what a lot of people do so okay. so we so the post show survey could be we want to know what you thought about x theatre company yeah. and at the end of it it lands, it lands on, on our... your page okay. and so yeah i mean we can we can lost we'll all those emails now but next time okay <laughs> katie sorry does yes. that not mean that the production company that receives the data then becomes the data Okay, do, can, I'm just wondering whether we just park this for two minutes okay. and we get to the end of this and then we come back and go, okay, so there's the company venue thing. Yeah. Because I want to make sure that everybody's got this right in their heads first before we go off. You're absolutely right and we need to talk about that. Yeah. Sorry, I just want to ask, you are talking about the opt-in, do you mean like the mailing list? Because we would also sometimes, say you went to jazz, few jazz events coming up, a few jazz events coming up, and then you had one show that was, um, you know, you thought we let the, let the people that have attended jazz events in the last, in the last few months, we let them know that that's occurring, but then 
they've opted in for email, so you want to do your report, but you do have to put that they can opt out of receiving them every time you send them an event, or are you just talking about the mailing list? Sorry, I'm confused now. Heather, help me out here. So, when you do your ticket sold report, who attended what events? Sorry. Yeah. Then you, you think, right, I'll target these people now with the, this jazz programme that's coming up. Yeah. You're not necessarily putting that on the mailing list to all of your database, just to the people that attended jazz events. No, you, can, you don't have to be that granular about it. No, you don't have to put an opt-out for them, because they've already opted in to email. But we're suggesting that they don't opt in. Under this model, we're saying okay. everybody in the future, if you adopt this approach, is automatically put in your pot. Everybody who buys a ticket, goes into your pot of people you can email anything to about what you do, unless they opt out. Okay. So it's a different way, it's not an opt-in, it's an opt-out. The people you've previously gathered, we'll have to talk about separately, because you can't suddenly go, oh, we're doing this now, so we're gonna yeah. do this with all the data that we've collected, because we didn't tell them that was what we were doing. Yeah. So um, they've got to carry on as they were before. And we need to be clear what we mean by mailing so if somebody's yeah. ticked the box that says join the mailing list, yeah. they've given you consent to mail them. Yeah. But that's not clear either, because do you mean post or do you mean email? So that's if it's consent... You know, if you, you buy a ticket, they, at the end, they sign up for email or post. So they're in through consent. The database okay. has, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But what I'm suggesting is you ditch that and you go for this. And do some stuff then, yeah. yeah. I know it's. I know it's. It's like it's really counterintuitive because it's not what we've all been told for years mm -hmm. how to do it. Uh, just another quick um, so because I also teach acting and um, at a studio. So if we have people who have bought classes, we can then opt, if as long as it says at the transaction, yeah. we will reach out about other things. We can then add them to that. Yeah, as That's long as it's similar goods and services. So, uh, yeah, so great. if you start flogging them clothes, no. I mean, Tate had this, didn't they, with people who booked to see exhibitions, they weren't allowed to send them emails about buying mugs from the shop, which I thought was utterly ridiculous, but that was the letter of the law. Because yeah. Similar goods and services. It's yeah. not mug, similar goods and services. A mug is not a show. Sure. <laughs> um, even though the mug was for the exhibition that they'd seen, but it was a mug and not an exhibition. So fair enough. Okay, so stick with me. We're going to get there. Um, it's worth pointing out that where we've switched organisations across from consent to this soft opt-in, this legitimate interest email thing, they have typically doubled the amount of usable data that they have. Not, you know, not dangling a carrot or anything, but that might solve our problem. Okay, so if you wanted to, we'll come back to the, the venue um, produce a thing in a minute. If you wanted to do this, if you kind of went, okay, I'm buying this, I'd like to do this, what would you need to do? Firstly, you would need to document how you've reached your decision. You can't just go, right, this is what we're doing now, change it on ticket sold, we're there. Okay? You have to actually do something that's called a balancing test. No need to be frightened about it, it's a piece of paper, one side of A4, two sides at most. Okay. Um, and that has to basically show that you've thought about your business reasons for doing this and balanced them with the needs and rights of the individual. Um, you need to make sure that you've explained your approach at the point of data capture, so usually at the point of sale, where that, where that person's putting in their email address, that's the moment, and in your privacy policy. So there's three things you would need to do if you wanted to do this. Firstly, do a balancing test, which I'll show you. Secondly, sort out your data capture, which Lucy's going to show you in a minute, and ticket sold. And thirdly, make sure your privacy policy reflects what you're doing and why. Okay. So balancing test, this is basically going, how do we balance our needs as an organisation? Why is this in your interest to do this? What, what are your reasons for wanting to do this? How will it compromise your business if you don't do this? Balanced against, how does this impact the individual? Would they expect you to do this with their data? Okay, It's a simple two-page document. I have got a pre-worked example and template that you're very welcome to have and amend for your own organisation. Just email me and I'll send it to you. Okay, And I've done it for ticket buyers at theatres and art centres. So 
you probably won't have to change very much if you want to do it. Okay? The idea is that should the commissioner come knocking on your door to say, huh, we've had a complaint from somebody saying you're doing this, right? So how did you come to that decision? You go, that's how we came to that decision, right? Needs to be talked about at the highest level in the organisation, ideally signed off by the chief exec with a date on it so that you've got the piece of paper because the majority of the fines that happen around GDPR are around people just not having, not showing that they've thought about it and they can document that and not informing customers correctly what they're going to do with their data. They're very rarely about anything else. They're usually about the fact that they didn't say they were going to do something or they said they were going to do something and they did something different. Okay. So you need to do that balancing test. It will take you 10 minutes. Second thing, point of sale. Okay, so here's the sort of thing you might do. From time to time, so this, this appears when somebody's put in their email address. From time to time, we will send you, not we might, or we'd like to, we will send you information by email about similar events and ticket offers. If you would prefer not to receive these, please tick this box. And then next to the box, I would not like to receive information about events and ticket offers by email. So it's really, really clear what they're ticking for. Or you can do a pre-ticked box, which basically says, blah, 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 if you would prefer not to receive these, please untick the box below. I would like to receive information about events and ticket offers by email and it's ticked. Okay. This, I have to admit, is contentious. Some people are really unhappy with any sort of pre-ticked boxes. Um, the law says that you shouldn't have pre-ticked boxes for consent but it doesn't say anything about not being able to have them for legitimate interest. And the way my brain works is that a tick is a kind of affirmative thing. So the way my brain is wired, the top one, I'm a tick in the box to not get something feels odd, um, whereas the bottom one feels more logical. But there's a lot of people who think that's really bad practice. But either way, they have to do something for you not to be able to email them. And that's what we want. Because the path of least resistance, do nothing, gives you what you want. Okay, That's what we need to do. But you're being really clear and transparent. You're not conning people. You're making it as easy as possible for them to do what you want them to do. Okay. And bless them, Aer Lingus do this. So it's not just Katie talking bollocks. Okay. Aer Lingus do this. If you can't read it, <coughs> you put your email address right below where you're going to put your email address. Tick this box if you, in bold, do not want to receive marketing communication, marketing emails with our latest offers. Okay? And then underneath, which I quite like, it says, this will not affect service emails mm. we may send related to your booking. So if somebody ticks that and goes, <clears throat> I ticked that box and now they're bloody sending me stuff about my booking. Well, mm. of course, they're going to send stuff about the booking. So I quite like the way they've done it. Um, and really good practice, link to the privacy statement. So if somebody's like, oh, not quite sure what that means, they can link straight through to the privacy statement on the website, which of course aligns beautifully with this because you've done that too, and it's all there. So I love that. This is an example uh, from Longcom of a pre-ticked box at the bottom here. So this is the opposite way round. It's already ticked, and it says, I would like to subscribe to Longcom newsletter. Um, I like that less because that feels a bit more sneaky. Not because it's a pre-tick box, but because it's sort of not clear whether it's actually consent or legitimate interest. That's a bit, I'd much prefer the first one. Um, I think it's really, really clear. Um, and then, you know, if you wanted to, you could say, well, okay, if we're gonna do that for email, should we do that for post as well? So that it's really, really clear, rather than hiding the post away in our privacy policy and just sending them what we like with my bold catalog, you could sort of say, well, we'll adopt the same principle here and do it for both email and post, but that's kind of up to you really. And again, you could do the non-ticked box or the pre-ticked box. And this is Shawbrook, this is a bank, um, and it's using legitimate interest. So it's saying, we're gonna do this unless you tick these boxes. Okay. So before I get onto this, let's have the conversation about venues and companies. Under the law, the person, the organisation collecting the data from the customer is called the data controller. And 
um, the ticketing company, so Ticket Sold, for example, are processing that data. They're not data controller, they're a data processor. They're using, you're using their system to process data. You're making the decisions about, they can't suddenly start emailing all your customers, can you? You can't do that. You're no. sitting there with all these email addresses. They can't suddenly go, oh, would you like a ticketing system? Um, <laughs> not that would be very good thing to do. But they can't do anything with that data other than process it. So you're the controller, you're the organization who's making the decisions how customers, how you will use that data, they are processing that data for you in order for you to do that, okay. So if you're a venue and you've got a visiting company coming to your venue, if you're contracting with the customer, the venue is the data controller. So even using consent, if people have said, I want to hear from you, venue A, about events and services, you can't pass that data on to the visiting company unless you've got another box underneath that says, would you also like to hear from company A? Okay. So when you say company A, you're actually naming the company you. Well, under consent, you have to, because it has to be granular. It's back to that granular word. And when we're saying granular, we mean really specific. Yeah. So, so here's, here's how a lot of venues, you're going to hate me for this, take it off. Here's how a lot of venues have ended up doing this. So, using legitimate interest for their own customers. So, they use this, opt out if you don't, you know, tick this box if you don't want to hear from venue, okay? Then, if they've booked a ticket for a certain uh, company, it then asks them the question, oh, we notice you've booked a ticket for this company X. Would you like to hear from Beard Company X about that, you know, by email about what they do? If you do, we will pass your details on to them, right? Unfortunately, and they would have to tick that box, actively tick that box. Unfortunately, my back of fag packet rates for that, you may be able, well be able to tell me something else that tickets off, is less than one in ten. People actually tick that box. And it makes that really really long so you've got you've got your questions about email post and god knows what for your own organization and then you've got uh, by then people are losing the world to live to be honest mm -hmm. and are very very unlikely to tick that box so as much as i have a lot of sympathy with visiting companies and, and you know think yes of course they want that data is it worth the conversation to have is it worth it and i know from a venue point of view it's like well we don't care because it's a visiting company it's not, it's not our data or whatever but the visiting company is really frustrating because they can't get access to any of that data. Legally, I think, I think you're struggling to find a way to give it to them. So things like doing a post-show survey very clearly about, you know, did you enjoy X, Y, and Z company performance last night? And then, you know, after it lands on their page with, you know, why not be the first to find out about what they do next? Some venues do this thing um, to make it a shorter list saying, do you want to hear from third parties? Zero emergency. <coughs> well, you can't do that. Yeah. that. It's not granular enough, it's not legal. So then what happens, from the visiting company's point of view, if you did the first option where you ask this additional question and you're collecting data on their behalf, so they're then going to say, can you give me that data, please, yeah. that you've collected? So you then send that data off by secure method, send that data off to them, okay? They then, within 30 days, have to write to those people or email those people to say, we've been past your data by venue A, here's our privacy policy, here's what we're gonna do with your data. If you're not happy about that, please let us know. So it's quite a thing, yeah? So if, if, you, if you're receiving information from a third party organization, under GDPR, you have to write to those people and go, we've been past your data by X, here's what we're gonna do. And again, you can sort of use, given that they've already opted in to hear from you, but you need to say what you mean by that. Because all they've done is say, you're gonna hear from this company by email. So you need to go and here's our privacy policy and here's what we're gonna send you. So unfortunately, it's not very straightforward. Just one point in addition to that, if that's in play, if any way, and the visiting company, you need to have a data sharing agreement in place as well. Thank you, so, they do. Um, now that can be one page where we have a template we did at the time. Yeah. The GDPR guide was just an additional step yeah. added to that laborious uh, efforts. Yes, it, indeed, because then that, 
and, and you need to also, the venue needs to put in its privacy policy yeah. that if you book for a company, you may be asked X, Y, and Z, and if that happens, we will pass them their data and they will contact us. Yeah. yeah, so you do need data sharing agreement in place. Um, so it all gets a bit complicated. Okay. Come back to that. This is my little ready reckoner of the different legal bases that you might choose to use and then the different things you might need to do. So what you have to tell them when you collect the data, what you need to say in your privacy statement, what the issues are with opt-ins and opt-outs, and anything else you need to think about. So if we look at the, the last column, is mostly what I've been talking about, is the email, what's called the email soft opt-in, <coughs> using legitimate interest, notification at the point of data capture, you must tell them that that's what you're gonna do, and they must have the option to opt-out. Um, you don't actually have to put anything in your privacy statement about it, but I would, so it's really clear. They must be given the, op the opportunity to opt out in every email communication you then send them. And every subsequent communication that you have with them must be about similar products and services. You can't then have somebody in the organisation, even that list that you've got of people that came to, can we just talk to them about this? No. We can talk to them about other events or however you've defined. So, just to go back to this, my three-step guide, be clear, what you're going to do with the data, tell people that, do only that and nothing else, stop using their data when you don't need to or when they ask you to. So the things you would need to do, you would need to sort out your point of sale, you need to do a balancing test to balance those needs, revise your privacy policy. On the do bit, you need to have systems in place to keep your data clean and accurate. We haven't covered all of that, but that's also in GDPR to say you really have to keep on top of your data. Um, ensure that all your staff know what is and isn't allowed, which is quite hard because there's all sorts of scare stories and a lot of confusion about GDPR. Um, and try to keep your data as live and active as possible, erase old data, stop communicating with people when they stop engaging with you. Can you say a bit more about the ways old data? Because we do have to, we can't just delete the record because we have to prove that we've erased it. So you need to keep something on this that enables you to tell that you've erased it. I know, I love that. It's yeah. like customer asks you to erase the data, but you can't erase it because then if it were challenged, you couldn't find that person to show that you've erased them. So Someone you just need to keep enough to identify that it's them and then erase yeah. all the rest. So it might be that you keep their surname and their customer number and their booking history could stay in there, but all their personal data like email address, contact details, address, all that. Air code. Air code, yeah, could all go. I had a request by email for somebody who had gone to um, Sorry, we, we've the, got people watching this live and we're not going to be able to hear you. Um, I had a request via email from a gentleman who'd used um, a, a mining tool. Yeah. And I just deleted his entire piece about the system. So I shouldn't have done that. Well, I would just erase the, con the personal details and leave them there in case it was challenged later. Oh, too late. Yeah. yeah. Future reference. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to hand over to Lucy. Are there any other, I mean, we can come back to this afterwards once Lucy's shown how all this works on Ticket Soul. It sounds really, really complicated, but actually, mm. if, you, if, you, if you write it down as a procedure, it's not. Yeah, the soft opt-in actually makes me more relieved that there's ways to get data legally. I mean, can I just have a quick show of hands? Who is currently using consent for email? So ev mm -hmm. everyone? Okay. Who might be interested in looking at this as an alternative? Yeah? Is there anyone who wouldn't? And are they brave enough to tell us why they wouldn't? What are your reservations about it? Is anybody? I think that uh, for venues is for sure a really good alternative, but I'm not sure about production companies. That's my 
because you do, you are in touch with the data that you get from the audience much less. Mm. You know, it's what you're, you were saying. So I'm not sure it's worth to go through all this changing of the privacy policy and everything since you will readily have to do your own ticketing. Yeah, you have to be doing your own ticket. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, if you're not, so I not think if you just have like, I don't know, uh, we, we have for example books or courses or whatever, but uh, we like rarely have our own box office. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think it's yeah. maybe it's more, um, it's less of a yeah, yeah, it's much fast difficult. to just ask the venue to do the post show email and everything. Yeah, yeah. Maybe yeah. that um, makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any venues hesitant about it? What if you've got any worries? What would stop you doing this? If you kind of like, okay, we like this idea, we're off to do it. What would stop you? I have no issue with doing it on the website where it's very clear and precise, but I worry about doing it through the box office where there's human error. I think that's what would make me a bit. Okay. <laughs> what we've done with some venues is uh, so where it's in person it's quite easy because what we've done is we've, um, we've encouraged them to create something called the data promise and they basically say here's how we're going to use your data and what we intend to do with it in really nice language, nice design, sits on the counter and uh, the, the operator on the counter says oh while I'm just processing your tickets could I just ask you to read that for me? Mm. They read it and they say are you okay with that? Would you like us to opt you out or are you happy with that? And in most cases nine out of ten they go that's yeah, fine. And then it's recorded on the box office system as an in-person transaction. And, and of course, if you think about this, if they start getting emails, they've got an unsubscribe button. What's the worst thing that can happen? They're going to get an email and they can unsubscribe straight away. So when you're doing your balancing test and you write this down, you kind of go, actually, really, the impact on the individual is so small, even if there was an error, you can always apologize and go, terribly sorry, of course we'll unsubscribe you. Right? So actually, that very small phone sales more difficult so you would need to absolutely train your box office staff to feel comfortable with saying some stuff on the phone um, and creating a really nicely worded script getting them to role play it so they feel really happy with it um, but it's it's doable and for the number of bookings you probably take by phone it's it's probably worth worth the effort and consent is more complicated. And consent, it's just as complicated to get, the, to get it by telephone, consent by telephone. Yeah, ju just to say from a venue's perspective that a, a soft opt-in is a game changer and no brainer. Yay! Yeah. Yay! In a good way? Oh yeah, oh god yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I'm not trying to yeah. con you all, and I have lots of venues in the UK doing it this way. Uh, not one of them's had significant complaints about it. I just say again, you know, Katie really, really, really has checked that the same things apply here, and they do. Lucy, yeah, show us how to do it. I'm going to invite my colleague Connor up as well. Yay. So all those tough questions that you have, please direct them, <laughs> Connor. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> just before you start, is anyone else a bit chill? Yeah, yeah. I don't know if that can be. Changed in any way, just in this room. I'm particularly confident. Maybe that's just me. It's unrelated to the presentation. I don't, I don't know if they'll see us. All right, carry on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, myself, Connor, and Paul are here today from TicketSolve, aka the data processor. Um, we've come in with a few gifts as well because we reckon at this stage, after talking about GDPR, um, we'll, we'll try and uh, make this a simple step-by-step -step guide. If you've had these conversations internally and you're ready to make these changes, this is where we come in and we help you. We're going to guide you through how to set up legitimate interest through your box office. Um, so uh, enjoy. So it's very simple. <coughs> I'll be delighted to know that. You can do it in as little as five steps and we've really broken these five steps down. Uh, you can challenge us, they might even be three steps. Um, but basically, the first step to setting up legitimate interest is you're going to go into your uh, a new setting actually that we've built recently at TicketSolve, which we're going to talk about. It's the customer opt in auto select. You're going to navigate to your snippets, that's anything that's going to be from your public website, any little snippets of text. 
we'll walk you through what you may or may not need to change, but just to keep an eye on. You're going to go into another snippet as well, which is just a bit of text that talks your audience members or your potential customers through um, what they are or are not soft or hard opting into. And then the next step is just to have a quick look um, from the terms and conditions side uh, of your public website. We'll take you through where you can go in to ticket solve if you do need to make any changes. And then our fifth and final step is just check, check, check in again. What does it look like for your audience members? Are you happy that you've pressed save? And it's really just uh, going over everything as well, um, just in terms of kind of best practices as well. So Connor, uh, you, you, can, you can back me up here. This is just something, it's, again, because it's new functionality, I reached out to some of my colleagues, in particular, Elin. I learned this yesterday afternoon. If I can learn it in an afternoon, you are super users of Ticket Solve. You will be able to do it much quicker than I am. So basically, what we want to do is you want to go and turn on your new feature Ticket Solve, which is the customer opt-in auto-select. You find this in general settings, and um, straight under general settings, You'll see here it's listed fourth. It says customer opt in auto select. Also, please feel free to take photos of the slides if you need to, um, just for, for your own memory. Also, we're adding that we have all this in a uh, ready made article as well. So, by all means, do take photographs and take notes, but we're going to link an article to what all this is in as well for you afterwards. So, uh, this is quite handy. Definitely. So, our next steps we're going to go into the, the snippet section of Ticket Solve. Full disclaimer, snippets, they're not scary. You do not need to make uh, any, any harsh, harsh changes here. It's just um, just making sure that you're comfortable and you know exactly where you need to go in. Um, the idea of going to the hairdresser should be much more daunting than going into snippets of tickets off. <laughs> so to navigate to the public website snippets, again, it's all located under settings. You'll see it down here, public website snippets. You're gonna go straight into there. So the next, thing that you want to have a look at is going into snippets and you'll see it's just down number seven on the listing opt in for email message so what we currently have on this screen here and I hope you can all see it and um, but it's so say please tick this box if you would like to receive email from us you can unsubscribe at any time so we made the assumption and um, that that most uh, tickets of users will be going down the route of consent so this is something that you'll just need to have a quick look um, uh, in your own account of tickets off The next snippet that you're going to need to have a quick look at is the public website terms and conditions because within here you're going to have a little note that says um, a little bit just about your, your privacy policy. Just go in and have a quick check and um, so you can do a quick search for public website terms and conditions. It'll say something along the lines of you know that you respect privacy um, you know with the objection of uh, protecting personal information when you're buying tickets. Just have a quick read through make sure there's nothing there that specifies is that you've gone down the root of consent and um, on this example in particular it says if at any point you wish to be removed from our database please do not hesitate to contact us so again just go in and make sure that um, you haven't specified we are using consent or if there's anything else that you need to you will need to include a clause of um, you know get in touch with us if you'd like to opt out particularly when you're going down the route of legitimate interest so if you do need to update this privacy policy text you just go into the snippet, you scroll down, um, if it's actually, I find a quick trick, scroll all the way to the bottom of the snippet and work your way up. You'll find a heading line that says privacy policy and you'll be able to find any text that you've included in there. Just remember, if you do update, please press save. Finally, head to your website. Make sure that the opt-in is pre-ticked. You can see the example here. Uh, it says, please tick this box if you would like to receive email for us. That's just because we didn't change the setting on this uh, this particular account on your own account it'll be pre-ticked and it will say something like uh, please untick this box depending if you're going to go down the route of uh, pre-ticking for opt-in or pre-ticking for opt-out now you can find all of that information and a little bit more uh, by just the QR code here on Zendesk and I know we have some people as well who are watching online if anyone's on Twitter please do feel free to, to share the QR code and uh, for our online viewers, uh, you can find it yourselves through Zendesk or perhaps someone will share this for us on, on Twitter later and tag to your form. Uh, and as ever, it's worth mentioning, uh, of course, we are hoping and want all our customers to be to, to do this themselves and update it, but if you're not sure or if you're having any problem, as ever, just get in touch on the phone, be it out there, and we'll help you with it as well. Um, 
One thing, just to go back a slide if you don't mind please, uh, the terms and conditions part, just so you know, where on every account, this is part of that, that, that page, the, the customer information page, the terms and conditions are in there. Sometimes we do find we have default terms and conditions on any account that cover you know, all, all the, the, the general scenarios, but you can edit them, update them, match your own terms and conditions, whatever you want. Uh, and there, there is a bit of HTML in there, which sometimes throws people, so that's mainly why I'm letting you know you can get in touch with us, because it's something we do regularly and, and daily, really. So uh, please just, uh, don't, don't be afraid to get in touch, we'll help you get that updated. And especially with linking off to your, your own privacy policy, things like that. That's really vital, as Katie mentioned, giving people the option to click over and see that in detail, to understand fully what the organization's intentions are with your data. Uh, it's really, really important to link that over. And often people aren't sure how to spell it with HTML, so we'll, we'll happily help you with that. Any questions? And just to say that this afternoon we'll be talking about what you do if you're a production company to maximise email sign up or maybe a sign up. And that's always going to be relevant to compared to venues as well. So uh, we will be looking at the other side of this as well. Thanks, Heather. Um, I think the collaborative approach that has been the hallmark of uh, the marketing forum since it's established since it was established all those months ago, I think can continue in implementing the changes to the database and how you use that data over the coming months. The notion of people tackling it on their own seems to be, it seems like a, an awful lot of you know, stuff to get through and an awful lot of stuff to understand. Whereas whether it's with um, other venues and theatres that you cooperate with through a network or just simply through, you're in the same locality or you're geographically close and you, know, you cooperate together. I think we would like to support uh, you and other organisations that you work with and maybe share the load of developing all these policies and publishing them and making the changes. I know tickets all have been I say, enormously helpful and supportive all the way through this, um, and I know not like everybody's on the tickets all system, um, but I think the through whether it's informal or formal groups, um, I think we would like to support you. So if you do need and would like additional support in terms of implementing this changeover in terms of how you use your database, then I think we'd be happy to talk to uh, both the Ticket Solve team and Heather and Katie over the coming months. Uh, that's a brief or a long-winded ad for the uh, Tomorrow Together event in Cork, um, which is the 18th and 19th of October, I think, uh, where there will be opportunities for people to collect and discuss and look more at these sort of initiatives and making data as this really work for you. Um, I think the, the striking part of the missing audience survey after two years of maybe not mailing your customers was just how far the databases had decayed mm. and how long it took to clean those databases before the missing audience survey went out. And then finding out through discussions with Heather um, and Katie that maybe only 20% of your contacts you could actually talk to. Mm. And that's a shocking figure in relation to you know, marketing and effective marketing. And actually on, on that, I would really recommend that before if you do change this could you please measure what it is now yeah. could you please have a look at your database to see how many what percentage you've got permission to talk to now and then as you go if you do adopt this approach then maybe after six months you could look at it again and tell us what difference it's made has it doubled it or not you know has it made no difference at all has it made massive difference how many are you getting out of ten um, in with the new approach compared to the old approach, would be really good with that. We've got one more thing we need to just talk about very briefly, <coughs> and that is you're going to start using legitimate interests, but what do you do about the people who kind of agree to be on your database and receive information from you through consent? You've got some people with one form of, 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 of what's the word? permission or something, Maybe and you've got basis. another lot of people yeah. and something else. Yeah. I mean, I don't know the technicalities of how the ticketing system records those, and maybe we can ask we can ask the ticket sold guys how that, how that works, but obviously what you can't do is go back to the people who haven't consented and suddenly go, oh, it's legitimate interest now, we're going to have all those people. 
so you can't do anything about those people but if every time they're booking a ticket they're really asked the legitimate or they're given the legitimate interest question then possibly you could make an argument that you know you could get them back in that way um, I think it depends how the consent question has been asked in the first place if it was a yes or a no and they've said no you definitely couldn't do that but if it was a tick here if you'd like to receive and they just haven't ticked it then when they next book a ticket if they're offered the legitimate interest option they could go into that pot in terms of of putting all of those into one pot together as people who are now how would how would the system actually deal with that would it treat them as the same effectively if they've said yes i want to receive it or i haven't taken the yes out of the box so therefore they're actually as far as the system's concerned they're the same yeah that's a good question um like firstly you'd have to record the date of when you're changing let's say you're going to implement a legitimate interest with the um whichever you option you choose with the tick in or tick, tick out just with the right language you know that has happened from the first of october on for example so then you know great from the first of october we can see who's booked and we know we can communicate with these people um you know based on what's happened uh, you then uh, I'd, I'd have to think about it further but obviously prior to that date if most of our people here probably have that fairly uh, template uh, opt-in scenario um and normally it is those words so you know if you'd like to hear from us please tick this box mm -hmm. Um, of course you have those list of people you could go back three years or whatever your time period is for contacting those people and know who they are um, could you communicate to those people um, and explain the change in, in policy around uh, um, how you handle people's data and then just tell them we're <coughs> just going to lump them all in with not in that language obviously with all people going forward so now you have your one centralized piece of kind of list or do you consider managing two lists no uh, which is i not definitely a good wouldn't idea. do that i mean I, ideally what we want is when you're doing your so you pull the people that you want to talk to mm -hmm. and then you want to go okay so we want people who've opted in or we want people who haven't opted out yes so you put all those in a thing together now in terms of telling people uh all those people you could when you update your privacy policy um which you'll have to do if you're going to do this anyway you could send out or put on the bottom of emails that you send out in the future, by the way, we've recently changed our privacy policy, so you may be asked next time you book, um, you may be asked this question. Yeah. Um, so, you know, so that they've been informed, but. Just one question I have just based on something you said a couple of moments ago. If, if people do have that language, please, you know, take this box for like here from us a bit, coming shows. Could, and you, then you change your policy to legitimate interest. Do you have any way of, legal way, an okay way of contacting those Everyone prees you hasn't opted in now to tell them we're changing. No. Not really. Okay. Just, just Other than, than, well, no, you have to. It's fine. Okay. No. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, we can help. We can do that within the system. Once people, people do change with the legitimate interest, we can combine those people into one list. Yeah. yeah. Mostly be in, but will be in. That's something we need to consider as well from a merchant perspective. Um, but anyway, um, because obviously they don't want to go across there and they are opted in. But I think just sort of putting something on uh, either on the website saying we've recently changed our privacy policy click here or telling people who are regular bookers with you um, that they might be asked to, you know, for their marketing permissions again next time they book a ticket. It's not going to do any harm. Yeah, but unfortunately what you can't do is apply it retrospectively. Yes, okay, that's the one takeaway from today. <laughs> don't do that, please. Okay. Any other questions, worries, thoughts? I mean, how would you feel about explaining this to your colleagues back at base? Because I imagine one of the problems that you may have is you might have, what's this thing? And we're going to change everything we're doing. And there will be all these people going, no. <laughs> what do you mean? That's not how we've done it all these years. We've been told X, Y, and Z. Is that, is that something that might be a problem? I mean, feel free to have the slides and share them if that's useful. Do you think that's going to be an issue? Maybe I'm just anticipating problems. It might be um, Katie that there is a sort of a, a program of support that you know takes everybody through the various steps and breaks it down into bite-sized chunks and tackles the issues like what do you do with your existing contacts? Yeah, yeah. You know, so rather than thinking of it as a complete changeover and you know, yeah. everybody tackling it um, as a huge big yeah, that it's it's broken down step by step. And uh, the thing that made me go kind of was uh, the balancing process. But I kind of just emphasize, do ask Katie for her template because it just goes ding and it's so straightforward. 
Yeah. 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 Yeah.